My name is Adam Gerard. I work at the Irish Traditional Music Archive. I'm the digital archivist there. And um, the presentation that I'm giving today is, I'm talking about it in terms of sustainable infrastructures um, and a new storage architecture for our collections. Um, now, on the face of it, this might not seem like it has the same uh, sustainability implications as uh, the sort of previous interpretation, more of an environmental angle. But um, I think after I get through talking about this architecture, you'll see that um, they're intimately related and that uh, thinking about uh, our digital infrastructure in our own organizations starting at home is uh, one of the best ways that we can have an impact um, in the world larger. So just a little bit of background. Uh, we are the largest collection of Irish traditional music, song, and dance in the world. Um, we collect all kinds of different materials, uh, song, instrumental music, dance, and um, our materials include things like manuscripts, books, scores, photographs, um, and audio and video recordings, so quite a breadth. And um, one of our main preservation strategies is digitization. Uh, not only that, but we're actually actively out in the community collecting materials, which is something that a lot of archives don't do. Um, now, given both of those, um, let's call it, uh, sources for content creation, uh, it's very important to have a digital infrastructure for storage that can handle all of the materials that are coming in. And um, so when I talk about uh, sustainable infrastructure in this case, um, I'm talking about a system that is designed to last for a long time, right? This is a major investment. Um, it's not something that you want to put in, develop workflows around, and then have to change in only a few years. I mean, people uh, like to say that technology changes um, so quickly and that we have to get a new phone every year, et cetera, just as an example. But I mean, I've got a phone in my pocket that I carry every day that's from 2010 and it works just fine, right? Um, so we have to think about these claims before we just believe them blindly. Um, especially being in an archive, we want to think long-term, and that means uh, thinking that way around the technologies that we choose to adopt and use as well. Um, other concerns here, stability, right? If we can't trust core infrastructure for storage of digital collections that really is responsible for preserving the country's cultural heritage, then that's a problem, right? We need to know that these things are rock solid. Um, similarly, they need to be reliable. And um, given the rapid and massive forecasted growth, um, they need to be expandable in a lot of different ways. And when it comes to storage, um, even let's say the lower end of enterprise grade storage, that's a challenge that's not totally solved yet. Um, so it's important to think about. And then another one that I've come across a lot lately, and it's kind of shocking to me, is that you talk to a lot of big um, providers of these kinds of technologies, you want to explain to them that, you know, archives have a very different, or museums, libraries, anybody in this space, really. As cultural institutions, we have really different concerns than their regular business clients, right? I mean, you try to talk to them about bit rot and fixity, and they don't know what it means. And it's amazing because, like, they have technologies in place, in a lot of their solutions that address some of these needs. 
uh, but they're not even aware of it until you talk to them about the specific concerns. So that's just one example, um, but really these uh, principles should be at the forefront of how we architect systems, uh, the technologies we choose, how we implement them. And that said, um, at ITMA, as you know, technology has gotten smaller, cheaper, faster, um, there have been many different media formats used along the way, and not to mention which um, formats not depicted here include lots of um, both analog and digital um, audio and video formats. So, you know, thousands of CDRs, DATs, um, videotapes of all different kinds. Um, and those are storage formats really as well. But given the technology that's been available over the years, there, there's been kind of a regular progression of the technologies that have been in place uh, from, you know, I remember when uh, an external hard drive was an amazing thing and, you know, all of a sudden we don't have to boot up from a floppy disk anymore. Uh, we, we've come a long way in terms of the data that we can store and do that at a reasonable price. But, you know, this too is a challenge for archives because as soon as you outgrow one system, then you have to replace it with another one. You bring into the picture all kinds of issues with having to lift and shift data to um, make sure that preservation concerns are looked after along the way. Um, but also, you know, when we're coming back to things around sustainability, think about the impact of e-waste here. I mean, once you deprecate one of these storage systems, it's not going to be put back into service probably. Um, so, the systems used have progressively grown, um, you know, now up to what I would like to call uh, prosumer grade, essentially NAS machines built for small business. Um, so, moving slowly up that chain. Um, but, you know, there are some problems with these systems. Uh, legacy systems as they've kind of churned through um, and the planning around them. So one of the problems about consumer to prosumer, I mean, this really denotes um, threats around reliability and stability. Um, there, a lot of these machines were never built to be on all the time, right? And we're talking about spinning disks largely. And when there are moving parts like that, they will break. Um, and so it's important to choose technologies that are built to last, uh, that you can count on there. Um, in, with that in mind, um, you know, you, you might want to call them relatively short-term solutions. I think from an archival perspective, that's probably true. I mean, we're talking in the handfuls of years, maybe, and not in decades or longer, generally. Um, then, you know, there have been issues with stability and reliability that haven't been mentioned. So, the idea of the fact that uh, disks fail, um, backplanes fail, um, you know, at every step of the way, you have pieces in the system that can break and will break eventually. Um, so, it's important to think about how you're going to address that too. Uh, one thing that comes up, um, comes to mind in that area is uh, in relation to the right to repair movement, right? Why are we not using storage appliances that have Lego parts that we can replace when they break rather than having to replace the whole machine? It seems like an obvious thing to do. Uh, and then expansion, right? So. I've re regularly got terabytes of, of digital collections coming in. And when you start to think about how you're going to expand to accommodate that forecasted growth, then, you know, 
okay, we talk about a single server model, right? You have a, a several um, rack space unit in a server rack full of spinning disks and what happens when you fill up that appliance? How many times can you then add an expansion bay? Right, there's a limit. Um, especially when you start to think about the limitations that come with the processing power for the head unit that's driving all the expansion shelves. Okay, so we need to be thinking about solutions for that too. And by the way, there are some very good solutions for it um, already, but not enough archives are using them yet. So that's another challenge with previous systems is difficulties in expansion. Um, especially because once you start, let's say you fill up one appliance, what do you do then? Do you buy another one and fill that up? Well, if you do that, then you're ending up with problems around siloed data, right? You have all of these different silos of different bits of data that, you know, you had to expand to a new unit. They're no longer connected. Wouldn't it be better to take care of this? in one way so that everything can live under the same namespace? Probably yes. And then um, the obvious one is that a lot of the archival principles that um, I'll, I'll go into more detail on, um, these technologies, at least the older ones, haven't been uh, had them in mind. And then we have a lot of technologies available to us that can do some of it automatically. Right, we don't always have to do um, to check files to make sure that they're they haven't been affected by bit rot manually. In fact, given the volumes of data that we're talking about, that's absurd. Right, so why not use technologies that are doing it in the background so that we don't have to think about it so much? Okay, so here are a bunch of principles that I've sort of summarized. Um, they're basically common sense. They've been pulled from um, a couple of different sources that I've listed there, but there are multiple other sources that basically reiterate these same principles. They come up again and again. Um, so we want to make sure we have multiple copies of any piece of data. We want to diversify our media types. Uh, that's to harden ourselves against failure. If one kind of media breaks, then you have it on another uh, media type. Duplicate copies in locations. Um, so you want any copies that you have um, not in the same location as your original, but then um, following on from that, it also then doesn't make sense to have the second and third copies right next to each other. Again, common sense. Um, and you can go on beyond that and you want to have, depending on recommendations you want to follow, um, copies in different geographical locations. That's mainly for uh, disaster related issues. So you want copies in locations that have different natural natural uh, disaster risks. Then we get into verification of integrity. So for most of us, that means using checksums in some way or another. Um, and by the way, it's important to remember that making a checksum isn't enough. Um, they're only as good as how often you use them. So we need to be setting up regimes for checking all the time, or at least on a regular schedule that we've justified around why we've made those choices. And then uh, we should be able to audit them as well. I want full reporting on the results of the checksumming to show that our important collections aren't being affected by bit rot and digital drift. Um, and then there are a few others here around tracking obsolete storage media. Um, which can be done in a number of ways. And um, a big one here is making sure that you have immutable or air-gapped copies, right? A lot of this is uh, based on ransomware attacks that have been very successful 
in the last several years. I can think of a couple of uh, museums and archives that had disastrous uh, effects from, from ransomware. And uh, there are certain technologies that can be used to do this quite easily. So I think it's a surprise that we're not all doing it. Um, but then a couple of things that I've added at the end there, especially in relation to how we can keep these systems going sort of longer term, um, still with enough, let's say, tech specs or power to keep up with the demand that we put on them, um, to reduce e-waste, et cetera. Uh, commodity hardware is the idea of the Lego part that I was talking about. There are lots of uh, servers now uh, built for storage that are plenty powerful for most use cases and everything can be replaced. None of it's proprietary. Most of it you can buy off the shelf locally. This is really great because if you look at the traditional model for enterprise storage, um, the big companies that provide these kind of services are working on an entirely different business model where in general, everything down to the little drawer that holds the spinning disk is proprietary and you can only buy it from them. That's problematic in terms of how long it takes to replace it, but also in terms of cost when that's an issue too. And then um, another value that we champion in libraries and archives and related fields is uh, using open formats for um, files, using uh, software that's open to manage it so that we have control, um, so that we can make the systems do what we want uh, when we want it because we own it and we should have that right. Um, and again, a lot of these systems that are um, available to us, they're full of proprietary software and they limit what we can do with our own content quite a lot. So uh, here we have just a very general uh, diagram of a proposed architecture um, that is sort of in development, but basically what we have here is a nearline storage appliance. Um, this one will be read only. The data, um, the, the primary master copy will live there. Then there will be LTO tape copies, which is, you know, people, uh, many tech uh, providers and vendors have tried to talk us out of using tape because it's thought to be uh, old school or something like that. But the fact of the matter is if you crunch the numbers for long-term ownership costs, uh, it's cheap, it's reliable, it's relatively easy to use. I mean, there are downsides too, it's slow, um, but you can make a couple of copies and stick them on a shelf and boom, you've got an air gap. <coughs> solution that's immutable that you know nobody's going to get to with their ransomware so that's one viable uh, solution there and then another one is offsite backup um, there are a lot of ways to do that but it offers the, an easy possibility for um, putting copies in a place with a different geographical um, disaster risk so that can be done through the cloud or it can be uh, bare metal in a server farm. And, um, you know, it depends, then it depends more on the cost model that's appropriate for the use case. Um, obviously bare metal is more expensive up front, but pretty cheap long term. Uh, whereas <coughs> if you know anything about the way that, especially public cloud storage providers are charging, um, you know, every time you want to look at a file, it costs you money. So uh, that just depends on use case. But um, this is the, the proposed um, general architecture that takes into account a lot of those archival principles. Um, 
But a few things that I thought I would mention while I'm up here is that there are some technologies that uh, will go a long way to help us out with the uh, achieving the archival principles that I mentioned. Um, and two of them sort of generally in categories are copy on write file systems and software design to defined storage. And they, they help to solve a lot of problems um, of sort of legacy systems. Copy on write file systems uh, are, seem like they were uh, designed with data integrity at the core. One of the main differences between those and older uh, file systems is that uh, copies, the information as it gets copied or transferred in any way, um, it's not erased or it's not vulnerable until the copy procedure is done and then the metadata is pointed to the new location. Whereas in older um, file systems, that's not the case. And uh, for example, if the power went out during a critical copy, uh, you would lose the information that was in transit. In this case, if that happened, it would just revert to the old copy and the new copy wouldn't be made. So that's an example of how some of these technologies can, can make our jobs easier. Other things that are really useful are asynchronous copying. So this way you can do, let's say, backups overnight when people aren't working. Um, and an, one thing that's interesting is that a lot of these uh, copy on write file systems sort of blur the line between um, operating systems, file systems, and, and do some uh, volume management as well. So you get, um, you get systems that are similar to RAID, um, that do a lot of, that do data striping uh, and redundancy in a similar way, but can actually be managed by the file system rather than having to rely on um, other software or even like how we used to use hardware uh, RAID curves. Um, and then one of the coolest uh, sort of suites of features here is for data integrity. Um, most of these systems do what's called scrubbing. You can tell it when and how often to scrub. It makes checksums. It checks the files. And then if it finds a problem, it just fixes it. Um, and then you can do snapshotted backups um, and those snapshots are read only. So that can be considered immutable. They're pretty hardened against um, ransomware attacks as well. And then in terms of software defined storage, this is when you start to get beyond, I alluded to the single server model before. Uh, this means that you can actually expand beyond those uh, server racks full of hard drives into clusters. The clusters can be located in different physical locations. Um, and the cool thing is that you can use lots of uh, smaller machines within the same namespace. So it, it kind of uh, abstracts and divorces the relationship that we're used to between uh, storage software and the hardware. You can use lots of little clusters um, and it appears all as one store. That's great because that way you don't just continue to expand up until your shelves are full of hard drives, but actually you can expand out. And theoretically that way, um, not only can you expand for capacities that are theoretically un unlimited, um, you get much better results in terms of scaling the performance and the availability as well because each of the machines in the clusters have processors that can do load balancing and sharing of different tasks so that you're not relying on one sort of central head in the same way. 
So I suppose the argument here is that designing a system using those kinds of principles and a similar architecture is more sustainable. And maybe it's just more sustainable at an organizational level. But I actually would argue that uh, if every organization did that, there would be uh, broader impacts um, environmentally and otherwise. So in terms of the system that I've been designing and, and these principles that we've been looking at, um, longevity, I would say, you know, normally you would plan a system like this for six to eight years and not more. Technology changes fast. But um, if you include commodity hardware, it's likely that the guts of the system could run a lot longer, um, 10 years more possibly. Um, stability and reliability are s much better than uh, small prosumer NAS machines. Uh, that's because these are actually enterprise grade. These are machines that are built to be spinning all the time um, and are much less likely to break, which is good when preservation is the goal. And then, like I said, uh, in some of these kinds of systems, you could expand forever, theoretically. Um, and we're not really thinking quite on that scale as of now, but um, I failed to mention, actually, that the digital collections at ITMA currently um, in storage stand around 60 to 80 terabytes. And then there's an additional 20 or so terabytes in a different preservation system. Um, and the scale that we're considering right now is into the petabytes. So that would conceivably last for quite a while. And then uh, the system that I've uh, talked about is clearly designed with archival principles in mind. Um, I'm not calling it a preservation system because there's one or two from my list before that are missing. Um, or the implementation hasn't been uh, solidified yet, so this is still in process. But um, most of these things can be achieved by the architecture that I'm talking about. Um, I'd say a good six or eight out of the list. And so I, I've just wanted to fill you in about um, the reasoning behind uh, developing a new architecture, how it has some relationship to sustainability, organizational, and sort of more broadly. And um, really I wanted to share because I'm interested in the experiences that other people have had as well and thought that if I could share here that uh, maybe we could continue the conversation. So. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you've done similar projects, and uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.